OK, OK. Hello, hello. OK, 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 OK. So please find your seat, and we can start. We are about to start. And there's a couple of seats in front as well here, if you want to, to look <laughs> close up, for, to me at least. Uh, thank you, uh, and welcome to White. Uh, I'm very excited that so many people have attended this uh, little uh, venue tonight, or this afternoon. We have the honor to sponsor and uh, host this event uh, together with the uh, Council of Tall Building and Urban Habitats. And I think this is their first event in Sweden, so we're very grateful for this. And this afternoon we will focus on uh, tall buildings, of course, in timber. And my name is Robert Schmitz and I'm a partner at White and also uh, in charge of some of the timber buildings that is going to be presented here later on. Uh, but today I'll have the honorable uh, task of uh, presenting the, uh, the presenters and make sure that their um, speeches are, stays on time. <laughs> so that's my job. Uh, the agenda for this uh, afternoon is it's a quite packed three-hour program, but we'll have a short break in the middle. So if, um, but don't wander off too far, because we'll, we'll have to have it in about 10 minutes or something. And after these events, we have snacks and drinks. So I hope you all stay for to mingle a little bit afterwards. And um, the global interest uh, of uh, engineered timber is increasingly rapidly throughout the in, um, globe. And I was invited three years ago to talk about Sara Culture Center at the CTUBH uh, uh, conference in Sydney, and uh, uh, the, the timber focus was only a small part of that, and uh, it was a small workshop, and it was held outside of the big venue. And but last uh, year, however, it was in Chicago, the timber, the tall timber section uh, was dedicated its own chapter, and uh, was in, in the main program, and was uh, one of the the most crowded ones that we attended, S and. Uh, in that chapter, all focus is upon Scandinavia right now, because we are in the lead of tall timber uh, development. Best practice and research is done by us. So uh, our mission this afternoon is to spread knowledge uh, how to build the viable and sustainable tall timber uh, buildings. And therefore, I would like, first of all, to welcome Chathlin Ahmad Murad up to stage. Uh, she's a market business development manager at Rambel and she will introduce you to a uh, Council of Tall Building and Urban Habitats. And a big applaud. Uh, thanks, Rob. Firstly, I'd like to thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedule for being here. Um, I'd also like to thank um, White for organizing this, Batman and Robin, I like to call them. Uh, we met them the first time at CTPH Dubai, and, um, and uh, we saw a little bit of Batman and Robin there going on. Um, just on to the next slide. Basically, I represent the CTBH Scandinavia Future Leader Committee. I co-chair this committee with Ricardo, and I have the committee here sitting in front. Um, the idea is that we bring people together in the industry, no matter architect or engineers, and we share knowledge together. Um, the FLC is a bit of a less, um, it's a bit of more casual uh, group, so we actually discuss trends together as well. Uh, we are supported heavily by the CTBH Scandinavia um, region chapter, and that's um, fronted by Sean Mills from Rumble Group and Henning Larsen uh, and Julian Chen from Henning Larsen, basically. The CTBH FLC and CTBH in general is um, based in Chicago, and um, the main committee sits in Chicago. Um, Ilke actually leads the entire uh, FLC, and as you can see, we, ha we are actually scattered all around the world. Uh, we hold events. We have held events in Scandinavia, mostly Copenhagen so far. Uh, we've held walks, um, basically visiting high rises and urban um, density in Copenhagen. We've held the CVFD and Wind Tunnel State of Art event in Rambol last year as well, and held the World Architectural Day. Today we have um, Timber High Rise here today. If you'd like to know more about our events, please visit um, our website or LinkedIn page. 
uh, which we can follow up later with a link to all of you. And um, I think I'm handing over to, back to <laughs> Batman or Robin. Yeah, no, only to Robert. Um, but first, uh, the first um, speaker will be Oscar Norelius, who was a partner at White, and he will, uh, he will speak about the viable high-rise for Scandinavia and give us a little show of uh, Sara Culture Center. Yeah. Yes, applaud. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Perfect. Hi, everyone. Really happy that you're all here. And I think it's worth mentioning that we have a, a really nice lineup of speakers tonight. Uh, with uh, a lot of knowledge, uh, both from research and from uh, delivered projects. Um, but what you do not know is that we have a lot of competence in the audience as well. Uh, many interesting people from the local market in Stockholm, uh, the key players, I would say, from the industry, and also people f uh, traveling in from both the UK, from, from Copenhagen, from Oslo as well. So that's another reason to stay in Mingle, because there's lots to discuss within the audience, I think, later on. Um, and uh, as Robert said, we're, uh, we're in the CTBU age, we're in the uh, FLC network together with Shazlin and Ricardo and, and the rest here, um, mainly because of two reasons. Um, one is that we want to put sustainability on the agenda uh, for the global development. Um, and that's something I think we can contribute with from Scandinavia very much. And then we see a development in urban uh, design in Scandinavia as well, which is going towards higher density as our cities are densifying. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's an important um, forum for us to learn as well how they tackle these kind of issues in other cities uh, with much higher populations and uh, densities, of course. But um, what I will show you is a case study of a tall timber that we're working on, kind of the centerpiece of our timber um, strategy at White, uh, a culture center and hotel located in northern Sweden, Skellefteå. Um, I would also uh, like to take kind of this first uh, opportunity tonight, uh, this afternoon to... Um, um, to talk uh, white timber very quickly, uh, white tall in Scandinavia. Uh, and uh, I have the luxury of having Florian Kosche, who's a structural engineer from uh, the concept phase of this project, to come speak later tonight um, at five o'clock. Um, so he will probably, I hope, go into the more technical details of the project. And I will stay more on um, the way we've worked with it, how we've managed to, to carry this project through, um, and the key aspects of using timber in a high rise like this. And I think we're all aware of this. We're using 10 times, we're emitting 10 times more greenhouse gases than we can afford today in Sweden. These are numbers from 2016, um, where the construction and real estate industry represented 21% of these emissions. And that's only calculating what was being produced in Sweden. If you added any goods that were imported from outside, uh, the number is even higher. And this, I would say, is our common responsibility in the building sector to address this and to make sure that we can find a more sustainable way towards the future. And that has led us to a mission that by 2030, all our architecture is going to be carbon neutral. That's our goal, and that's what we're working towards. And carbon neutrality for us um, right now means reducing the emissions at all stages of a project to a maximum. Uh, and the uh, emissions that cannot be avoided uh, are compensated uh, during the life cycle of the building um, by uh, renewable energy production, and if you're using timber as a structural material, carbon sequestration. And I'm sure that the following speakers are going to explain carbon sequestration much better if you're not aware of how it's working. But um, the way that we usually talk about it is the carbon that's contained in the timber that you put in a building uh, is harvested by new trees planted um, where you took the trees to put in the building in the first place. Uh, so this, of course, means you have to have a sustainable forestry as well further up the procurement line. But for us as planners, as architects, as designers, as developers, uh, one of the most important decisions to make or measures to take to reduce the carbon emissions of a building is to choose a structural material that is sustainable. Um, and if you compare the alternatives that we have today, wood, steel, concrete, the answer is quite clear that wood has the lowest impact of the large scale available structural materials. And since um, the creation of cross-laminated timber, the new era of engineered timber products, um, timber industry has moved from doing stick build, uh, small single family houses to uh, slightly larger projects, uh, mainly multifamily residential uh, projects, um, 
smaller office spaces, light industrial. Uh, this is a visitor center in Kristianstad, so also small public pavilions. And this is a development that we see around the world at this scale, I would say. And it looks quite differently because everyone has a different tradition of building with wood. We have a different access, or the access to different kinds of wood. Um, but we are very much uh, at the forefront in Scandinavia at this scale as well. Um, what we don't see as much of in other countries is realized tall timber buildings. Um, we happen to have legislation that does not, uh, that does not categorically limit the height of timber buildings. So we have had the possibility quite early on in this development to realize tall timber buildings. Jessica will show us the building to the right later on, an 11-story building in, in Finland. Triet in Norway is 14 stories, and then we have Mjöstorn at, uh, at 18 stories, which is today the tallest timber building in the world. And since the interest in timber uh, is growing around the world, um, so is the interest in these buildings. And that's how we've been projected somehow to at the forefront of tall buildings, uh, at the discussion for tall buildings in the world, even though we are at quite modest heights if you compare it to conventional structural um, uh, materials. Throughout these projects, uh, we've been acquainted with the characteristics of timber, um, uh, acquainted or reacquainted, because many of us have a relationship to timber as a construction material from smaller scale. Um, everything from um, the impact on the climate, but also the positive effect it has on the people using the building, um, uh, on the, uh, directly on the interior climate, uh, but also on the psychological effects that we have been conducting research demonstrating that uh, it has a positive effect on patients in healthcare, but also on stress levels for people in office buildings. Um, and we've also learned how to take advantage of the fast construction times, the silent um, construction sites, and the very high prefabrication rates that we can use since timber is such a lightweight material. And before stepping into the culture center, um, I think it's important not to forget what we've developed before moving into timber construction. And um, based on our kind of common experience and common knowledge of traditional or conventional, I would say, concrete structures, we've been able to develop buildings that um, perform extremely well in their urban environment for their users, for the programs they contain, uh, very efficient buildings, um, and also for energy use. And all of this we need to carry with us as we transition over to timber and not forget. Um, and this is not an easy task because even though we have tall buildings, a few that have been realized, this is the tallest building in Sweden today. It was built 110 years ago almost, 34 meters high. The church in Kiruna, it's actually being moved um, by now. But um, the challenge that we see is to maintain the same level of performance in a building built in timber, because uh, they have to respond to the same criteria as a concrete building would have in terms of function today. And that's a task that we gave ourselves when we entered the open competition for Skellefteå Culture Center and Hotel that was launched four years ago. Um, we collaborated with Florian Koshe right from the beginning of the uh, process. And what we designed is a very complex mixed-use building, which is standing right at the center of town. And it is a full timber structure from the bottom to the top. And as I said, our starting point was to make a culture center and a hotel that functions as well as they possibly can, and using timber as much as we can, instead of making a timber building that also kind of hosts a culture center and hotel. So it's an important order. It was more important to realize the culture center than to realize a timber building. For those of you who don't know Skellefteå, oh, this is very bright. Um, it's quite far up north in Sweden. Uh, it's almost half the distance it is to London from here. Um, and the building program is approximately 30,000 square meters. Uh, it occupies the entire city block. So it has to deal with very different urban situations around the building. And the collection of timber boxes that you can see in the lower parts, they house the cultural program, which is six theater stages, uh, the city library, and two art galleries. Uh, they are composed to build up from a smaller scale towards the high rise, which houses the hotel, uh, 20 stories high, 208 hotel rooms as of now, and it's facing the main square. So this is the landmark that is marking the most central spots of the city. And when it comes to using timber then in a building and making sure that it functions just as well as it would have with a conventional structure, um, transparency is key for the urban integration. Um, 
And in order to create as transparent facades as possible and the possibility for passers-by to see what's going on inside and be invited, um, we've worked with um, uh, a facade that is free from diagonals. We can place entrances exactly where we want and where we need to in the urban environment. And the lateral forces are handled by CLT walls within the building instead. You can also see here that the outer facades are made from pressure treated spruce um, or uh, natural timber and they are going to age as if they were untreated. So this very tall building, this big complex, when you approach it, you can actually touch timber and feel this uh, ancient material kind of reintroduced in the city center of Kolefkio. The high rise on top is a timber structure that's clad with a double skin facade that we've designed to be as transparent as possible so that you see the structure uh, through this glass even during the daytime. Um, so this way, the image of this building will be the timber structure from afar, and even when you get closer, you can actually move in and touch the timber. Another thing that's quite unique with Scandinavia is that we can expose the structural timber within the buildings that we design um, when they're tall. Many other countries that allow for taller buildings have to um, cover it up with gypsum boards um, because you can't have combustible materials within the spaces. We don't have that issue here. So uh, we're exposing the structure as much as possible in the interiors. Uh, and this way we can also not only benefit from having it giving character to the spaces, but we also access the uh, indoor climate um, characteristics of wood. So it can absorb and reduce humidity, for instance, which is a very important issue in Kolefkio, where the climate is extremely dry during the winter. Um, flexibility is something that we worked a lot on uh, the last 20, 30 years, I think, creating buildings that can last over time that can be adapted to um, an ex um, a program that's evolving, um, sometimes even changing. And in order for this building to be sustainable, it needs to survive for a very, very long time. 30 or 50 years is not enough. It needs to stand 100 or even more. And one key issue, of course, is spans. So that's why we've uh, desi designed these special trusses together with Florian. I think he will go more into detail. But where we combine timber and steel, and we show how they work together with tension and pressure. Um, in different ways. The lower part uh, is maybe not the focus today, but uh, we have a very complex program. The Grand Auditorium seats 1,200 people. It's the largest theater stage in the northern Sweden that uh, fulfill the highest national standards. So the Culture Center is almost a, a catalog, you could say, of different solutions for acoustics and um, uh, solutions for using timber. Moving up, um, this is the only plan that I'm going to show before Florian takes over. Um, this is one of the first decisions we made to, to use two separate cores placed at either end of the hotel tower. Had this been done with concrete, we would have had one central core. Um, but by doing this, two external cores that uh, span the whole width of the building, we can use identical units between them, 18 of them here, and free up the facade entirely for our design. Uh, and we've managed to create an energy efficient building with a fully glazed facade, so you can have the unobstructed views over Kolefti and its surroundings. And when you get to the upper floors, you can actually see out to the sea um, on a clear day. These rooms are fully prefabricated as 3D modules. And bathrooms are put in as modules on their own, finished. Uh, all of the installations are prepared ahead. Uh, there's only the furniture missing, or part of the furniture. And they will then be stacked on site. Um, 13 stories of modules on top of five stories of cultural center and then two um, stories built on site. And this has been one of the keys to maximize the economic gains of timber and to compensate the risk that we have in using a, um, a technique that has been done before. Um, so uh, we have very fast assembly times uh, on site that will be an upside in the future. At the very top, there's a restaurant and a spa. Uh, at the very late stage, we, we added a pool after the hotel owner uh, asked us to do that. Of course, this is an increased complexity to have a public top floor with a fire and um, evacuation, of course. But uh, this building will be seen from Kolefkio and all of the surroundings uh, by everyone all the time. It's the tallest building in the, in the region. So it's important for people and inhabitants to feel that they can actually access and use this building um, in, in, a, uh, in their every day when, when they wish to. It's not just an expression of someone else's access to the views. And this is, is one of the reasons, I think, why timber is a viable solution for Scandinavia as well. Um, a high rise becomes a symbol, especially when it's not grouped in a cluster. When it's alone, it becomes an expression um, of density, an expression of the place where it's standing. Um, it's 
often been an expression of innovation and new technology, and it's also an expression of money and power. And today, I think in Scandinavia, that we are so aware of the climate issues, um, there's no way to build a tall timber building that does not express sustainability as a top point on our agenda, I think. Um, I think it's uh, going to make the journey much easier. It's, it's good for the environment, of course, for real, but it's also going to be a key aspect when going through planning processes and public consultations as well. And we have seen many tall buildings in Sweden and Scandinavia these last years that have been scrapped after a few years um, because of public um, consultations, I would say. Because this, these are the maths of the materials in the building. Uh, we've done a calculation of all materials that are put into the building. And it's difficult for to see for you, but the emissions connected with the concrete, the steel, the timber, the glass, and all the fittings amounts to 8,350 tons of CO2 equivalent. The timber structure stores 8,900 tons of CO2 equivalent. That's the same as 13,000 trips to New York from Stockholm. And if we only look at the materials that go into the building, we actually have a positive impact on the climate. Over the lifetime, these materials will remove more carbon dioxide from the environment than they actually emitted when building this. The construction is not included in this, and we're working on that this spring, and not, uh, and not the uh, energy use either. So that's going to be interesting to see how these, um, the use of energy is compensated by the 1,200 square meters of solar panels that we have on the roofs and on the top floor facade. And <coughs> one of the keys of realizing this project has been to conduct a very well-defined process. So from the very beginning, at the very first conceptual meeting uh, in the competition, uh, we were not only architects at the table, we had the structural engineer, we had the environmental specialist, and we shaped this building together from the start. And then we've been working together in a BIM environment to make sure that everyone's on board with all the decisions, all the changes, all the measurements. Um, and we've even done the coordination in a video game motor uh, to have uh, feedback very fast. On site, um, the production, I can just go back, um, it will be paperless, everything will be done through iPads and uh, they will also have access to the model to see how things are put together to realize this. I would say one of the great takeaways from this project as well is that when you focus on realizing a building in timber, um, I, we thought maybe in the beginning there's a risk of forgetting the rest, but once you have this process in place, uh, it's much easier to drive through other innovations within the building, with the project. Um, so we have uh, developed a double skin facade and the ventilation of that. We have investigated natural cork as insulation materials, solid timber for the acoustic paneling. Uh, of course, the modularity of the hotel as well was not a given from the start. And natural ventilation of the larger foyers to reduce energy emission, energy use over time. Skellefteå Municipality is the client. Um, we are now working for the turnkey contractor Hent and construction is underway. Uh, you can see some of the people who have been involved here. And we always like to compare our early renders with the built result to make sure we're fulfilling the vision that we've sold both to our clients and to the inhabitants. So this is an image taken in early December, I would say. Uh, it has risen a bit more now. And uh, I will let you judge by yourself if we have fulfilled our vision. So the renders are on the left, if anyone is unclear about that. <laughs> The Culture Center opens the uh, second quarter of 2021. Hopefully we'll be able to arrange some CTBH visits during the construction time, but mostly when it's finished as well. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> Very nice project. Um, let's move on to Marie Johansson. Uh, she's a senior researcher at RISE, uh, the Research Institute of Sweden, and she will present uh, the, her research regarding the matter. Uh, welcome with a big applaud. Thank you. Well, let's see. Okay. Thanks. And then I will talk a little bit about research here together. And so my name is Marie Hansen. Well, RISE is the Research Institute of Sweden. That's a merger of all the research institutes that we had in Sweden, almost all at least, you can say. So we have a, the new name now, and we are reorganizing. And the purpose of a research institute, we should also say, is to help the uh, companies and the society in Sweden with development and 
sustainability is, of course, one of the main issues that's important now, I should say. Uh, but so I'm working at the Wood Building Technology Department. In my case, I'm located in Växjö, one of the cities in Sweden, where we build a lot of uh, timber buildings. And the other main department uh, part, uh, location where we have people is in Skellefteå, a kilometer or something about away from the cultural center you're talking about. Uh, I'll talk about some of these uh, research projects we have ongoing about tall timber buildings. And I should also say that what I'm talking about is the results from several research projects that have been running for uh, since 2015, so it's almost five years now. So this is a collection of results from this. And we should also say that I'm not the one that has been working with all of this. There is a lot of partners that have been involved in these projects. And White for One has been in involved in the project, but also a lot of other companies and institutions. So I will be talking a little bit about tall timber buildings today. And when we talk research, we are a little bit higher than what we normally build. So what we have been looking at in many of these projects is more than 20 stories, then we are high, because that's higher than has been ever been realized yet in the world. And my background is structural engineering, so it will be a little bit more technical here. So a little bit about what kind of building systems can be used, a little bit about the fire safety, and I'll actually show some life cycle analysis results as well, where we have been comparing tall timber buildings with uh, lower timber buildings. Uh, let's see. So what? Tall timber buildings, more than 20 stories, I said, which is a tall building if we talk timber. And what is special with tall buildings compared to normal buildings, or what we call medium rise? It is that the horizontal loads are increasing a lot. Wind loads, earthquakes, which is also one reason that we can build high in Sweden, because we don't have to worry about the earthquakes horizontal deformations, and the horizontal sway at the top, which I guess have been an issue for the building also in Skellefteå. But that's the issue that, especially in Sweden, is actually going to decide the dimensions you need in your buildings, if you're about 14, 16 floors. And then fire safety is the other big issue that is uh, governing what we are do can, can do at the moment. About eight floors, we have new regulations, and about 16 floors, we need to look at each building separately, because then we are above what we can use standard methods for. Uh, but in principle, if we build in timber, we have a building tall. When we need to move over from the stick built system, we can talk about moment resisting frames. But that is difficult in timber because it's almost impossible to make something that's moment resistant in timber. That's what you normally often use in steel when you can use welding. But we, instead we move over to the truss systems where you have the truss elements going zigzags or we have the planner elements that use shear wall as stabilizing instead. And we can actually show that we have built high in both these two systems. The truss system, this is the one that's tallest at the moment then, in Norway, Mjöstornet, where you can actually see the large truss system through the facade here. Look into it. So you need a huge uh, stabilizing truss system in this type of building, in the facade, which is used here, or in the core as well, if you want to. You need continuous columns. Uh, you need to have all your materials organized in the same direction, otherwise you have a problem. You had the orthotropy of the timber before, so that's also necessary. And we know that we can build this up to 20 floors going higher, probably, but we don't know how high, even if there are some examples of drawings at least of much higher buildings with truss systems. Uh, in this case, I chose for the planner system, CLT or LVL. Uh, this is one of the tallest built with this system. This is origin building in uh, Quebec City in Canada. 
which also is a country with a lot of forests that build in timber as well. So this is uh, a CLT building, uh, 13 floors with a stabilizing system with shear walls. So the walls take the horizontal loads instead. And built with continuous walls, meaning the walls go up all the way and the floor systems is hanged on the inside, which will be necessary to when we build so high, otherwise we get too much deformation. Uh, this one then should work for 19 floors, because that's what you have in Skellefteå. In at least one year's time, we know that it will be working. Uh, <laughs> it's 20 stories. <laughs> uh, is it also taller than the Mjørstornet building? No. No. <laughs> they did have to redo the design of that one with the pergola on the top to be the highest one. <laughs> to make sure. We can say this is the old timber systems. Uh, you, there are other ways to build as well. Probably a little bit more complicated with the 3D trusses from the uh, Triet building in there again, pre-stressed systems with steel wires that actually pre-stress the system from the top all the way down, where the steel in this case take loads, or hybrid systems, which in many parts of the world is probably the most what will be used. You switch a lot of the timber or the concrete into timber, making them good for sustainability. In this case, it's from Canada, Vancouver, 18 stories with concrete elevator shafts, and then timber, CLT around it. And what we can say is that this is something about general dimensions, which would be necessary if you start to do this. Uh, you will probably need a floor to floor height from here to the next level of at least 3.5 meters, because the floor will be quite thick in a timber building. Uh, you can make a floor that is 0.4 meters, but that's the most of the timber floors are deeper than that. Yeah. Stabilizing system, you can have a free length in, if you build high, five to 10 meters between them probably. And the wall thickness will be quite thick in uh, uh, these buildings. I don't know how thick the walls are at the bottom floor in Skellefteå, uh, but they probably are 300 millimeters, because that's what they can make in the factory at the moment. The columns in Mjöstornet is actually 1.5 meter by 0.6 meter, so they are quite huge. And we probably need extra mass if we build about uh, above 15 stories. Because for structural engineering, the real challenge is actually the wind-induced vibrations. This is the requirement for acceleration which is what we measure at the top of the buildings. If we go by the Swedish calculations, the regulations, saying that if we are above these two lines, the lower blue one is for uh, residential buildings. Even if we start building with a regular timber building at 12, 16 floors, we get above the, uh, what is allowed. What we can do, the easy way, at least in the calculations, is to add mass, in this case, concrete, and we need quite a lot of concrete if we calculate directly using the uh, rules of thumb that we can find in the codes. Those rules what uh, comes from the steel and uh, concrete industry, so we know that they are not really working. So in reality, we can't trust those regulations because we will need better calculation models. So this is one example we need to move over to more advanced design calculation methods if we really want to do this by, in a larger scale. But we have still issues with doing this because there is a lot of things we don't know. What kind of parameters should we actually put into these? Adding mass was one thing we can do. That's not the only thing we can do. We can change the shape of the building. That's probably the easiest one. Building a building like Mjöstornet, which is really a tower, is the most difficult shape of the building to stabilize. In many cases, we have taper building, or we have complement buildings. We have a lower building at the side of the huge one that 
helps to stabilize. In some sense, that's what they do done in Skellefteå. You have a six-story building next to the 20-story building, make it, it in reality a tower that's 14 stories high, making it easy. And in most cases, that is the type of building you will need, will have anyway. Rounded corners is, on the building is actually also a good thing. Adding stiffness or add dampens with mechanical systems, which will, is done for tall buildings in steel and concrete can be done. Uh, but what do we, so there's a lot of things that can be done today. But what we really need to know is a little bit more about the actual values. How do these tall buildings actually behave? So we can get calculation methods and models that work a little bit better. So what we really need is verify our models for stiffness and damping to see how do these buildings really behave. And for that reason, we actually started a European project where we measure in many different buildings all over Europe, from Sweden, Norway, down to France and UK. So we're actually measuring these buildings and see what happens when they are put through loads. And this project is built up by doing not just the looking at the buildings, we need to look at parts of the building as well, so we design the system correctly. So this is measurements done by uh, Linnaeus University and uh, our PhD student at Moelva, where they measured on this uh, huge truss system. Uh, but we will also be measuring on the real buildings with the forced load in this case. That didn't work. Let's see. We get this one to start. No, it didn't. Uh, this is measurements that was done in December last year, where they actually have a huge machine put on the 12th store of this building, 12th floor, to actually move this one so we know the force we are shaking the building with and then measuring the building to see what happens. So we actually have the real values that we need in the calculation models. And by doing this, we will be a lot sure about what happens. Uh, so hopefully, in a few years' time, we have better data for these buildings. Uh, you can say something about the fire safety design, which is the other big issue here about building tall. Over 16 stories, this gets a little bit more tricky in the Swedish code, at least. You need to do an analytical fire design which is a little bit more work than you normally do. So you need to work with the fire engineers already from the beginning in the project. The analytical fire design includes a lot of factors to identify what you need to look at. Uh, the ver you verify the fire safety, you control that, and you need the documentation of how to do these fire safety measures. And you also need the documentation and follow up at the building site. So it's actually done. And uh, in this case, they actually managed to do an analytical fire design of two 20-story buildings that was uh, designed for one of these concept studies, where White and BTB did one of these buildings, and CF Muller and Bjerking designed another building like this to see. And then our fire design engineer companies, Briab and uh, Brandskyddslaget, did an analytical design of these two buildings. And uh, if they have to, to say what they think should be used, is you need that, uh, sprinklers in these tall buildings, which you have in uh, Skellefteå, because that will be necessary also when it's a hotel directly, so that's nothing. Uh, they say that you need to protect the load-bearing system throughout the, the whole fire. And that means that you cover, need to cover the load-bearing structure with three layers of fire gypsum. Then you are on the safe side, then you know that the, uh, the load-bearing system will not take, uh, be a part of the fire. Then I see that there will be some visible uh, timber structures in there, so then you have some extra safety for that building, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> 
and you need a lot of extra care with the fire stop, the ventilation and so on. Limited amounts of visible wood in the facade. So this is what they say is, then if you do like this, you are on the safe side. Otherwise you can make some technical changes and do something like this. Do it with visible systems. Uh, this is what they recommend today. If you go over what can be done, there will there is a lot of work ongoing about uh, doing new calculation models for fire, where you can actually use real fire data instead of a standard fire. You can include what happens with the gypsum, and you can include what happens with the material in the load bearing system. If you have these calculation models, then you're better and more sure about what happens, and you will probably be able to use visible wood. Uh, there's also ongoing work for CLT with glue, with better fire performance. That is not a problem if you built medium-sized buildings, but if you build high and you want to have visible wood, this is something that could ha will help. And then there's a lot of work ongoing on sprinklers where you can do a lot of work to change the amount of water that's necessary if there actually is a fire with high pressure dim systems and so on. So there's a lot of development ongoing and a lot of tests ongoing on fire, and which is also an issue that's discussed a lot about fire and timber buildings today, especially in the UK, but maybe that will come a bit later. Yeah. Uh, I will also show that we did life cycle analysis of these tall buildings that was on the concept stage here. In this case, it's also the production stage. Uh, where we have looked at a little bit lower, build, uh, 18 story buildings, version of these buildings, uh, and the production of the raw material, the transport, and the manufacturing. And we compared it to a standard five, five story building in this case to see how much CO2 emissions do we actually have if you just calculate this part of it. And that's, you can see, numbers. Here we have, we can see that we can actually reach the same level of uh, global warming potential or the CO2 equivalents per square meter for a tall building in timber as we do for a low timber building. Meaning that building taller is no problem in this sense. In many other cases, you need a lot more material, but we don't need that much, so it makes a difference here. And then we know that these numbers compared to Many of the concrete buildings we are building today is low. Uh, so the same amount per square meter. Uh, of course, we have less influence of the foundation and the roof. But the floor structure, where we needed extra concrete in these cases, contribute to, to a large part. Uh, the glazing that was on one of these buildings actually have a lot of impact, you can see here. Uh, so there's a work to do in developing the glass facade system. There are probably both better and worse systems than what used here. Uh, the fire protection material that we need to use, the, the gypsum and so on, has a huge influence here. So if we can use less of that, it will be better. Uh, there is an influence of the sprinkler system, but that effect is very small. So that is no problem for the CO2 emissions. So adding sprinklers for safety is something that's actually is a very good idea. If we want to make it even lower, uh, you need to consider the timber pro products, where are they produced, because the transport has a new influence on this. Uh, consider, can we lower the amount of concrete and the amount of steel that we need, especially in connections? that will be better. Uh, and then we can say that there will be improvements here over the time. Uh, the timber products, we will be able to use less glue and lower climate impact. That's under development. I think Storenzo probably has work going going in the company about these issues. But there, of course, is also new concrete recipes and so on, and the glazing structure will probably also be possible to make better in the future. Uh, 
So I will end this more or less with some conclusions. You can say that it is possible uh, to build more than 20 stories today if we want to. But they can be optimized if we have more knowledge about especially the structural dynamics design. So we know what we actually, that our models are good enough so we can use them to optimize the buildings. And the same can be said for the fire safety design. And then, of course, there can be a lot of development done for new building systems where we can move over to more hybrid systems. I think a good solution. Probably better to use the concrete in the concrete, in the elevator shaft, than to put it as just as a mass. So by doing this, we can also change a lot of the concrete in normal concrete buildings today to timber, which will help us as well also in tall timber buildings for this. So there, I think I will end this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so it's okay to be as tall as possible. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> you need a challenge, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we do. We, we do. We need a challenge. And yep. now we're going to have a little bit more of an international from our side uh, in perspective. Welcome, Alan. Uh, Alan Mc. Daudo, <laughs> is it right? Yeah. <laughs> he's a structural engineer uh, and an associate at Rumble UK. And he's going to talk about his perspective and show Dolston's uh, works as a timber case study. Thank you, Robert, for getting my name wrong, but uh, I'll forgive you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for having me here today. I'm uh, just going to go through uh, a couple of things. Really, uh, talk, I'm at a tall timber conference, so I'm going to give some of my own thoughts on tall timber. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Dawson Lane, or Dawson Works as it's now called, uh, and do a bulk of the presentation on that. And then if just a few thoughts about where I think uh, the industry is going to go forward in, in the future. Uh, but first, just a bit about Ramble, a bit about me. Uh, I'm a structural engineer for, for Ramble uh, for about 15 years now. Uh, over that time, you know, we've done about 100 timber buildings, um, 30,000 meters cubed of timber spec, and I kind of like timber a lot. I like working with it. It's a uh, nice natural material, and, uh, and hence I do a lot of timber projects. Um, and, and I'm quite happy that Ramble also do quite a lot as well. They're happy to help me out there. Um, so tall. What's, what's tall? What's tall mean? Is it it's quite relative? So let's, let's, uh, let's look at some tall tall buildings. We've got, um, that's a tall building there, it's Burj Khalif, uh, Taipei 101, uh, even the pyramids, they're tall, they're super tall. So where, where, does, where, does, where does timber currently sit with, with that? Can you, can you see it? <laughs> Is it there? Have, have a now. Yeah, so that's where we currently are. So I, I think maybe, maybe in, in, in retrospect, you know, uh, do we mean medium size or, or small to medium size, but, but tall for timber? Uh, or maybe, maybe we're not looking at this in, in the right way. Perhaps we should look at it in a different way. And I, I'm an engineer, so I'm going to use some, some maths and like charts as well. Um, this is the Bur Burj Khalifa. Um, if we take a building and look at it, okay, well how, how slender is a building? I'm going to use a very crude analogy of um, the width of the building versus the height. So for this one, for every nine meters tall, it's one meters wide. That's a, that's a slenderness ratio. Um, let's look at another one. This is the Taipei 101. It's a half a kilometer. It's a slightly lower slenderness ratio, so it's more stockier. So it's uh, one in seven. Um, another one. Uh, this is more recent in New York, three, 432 Park Avenue. Uh, one in 15, wow, look at that. That is a slender building, really slender. Um, really interesting as well. I mean, they've got empty floors just to let the wind flow through so they can make it work. Um, yeah, but, but quite slender. And uh, the latest one, uh, 111 West 57th Street in New York, one in 23. Wow, I'd be nervous if I was the engineer on that one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but slightly taller than, than uh, the one previously, uh, and uh, 1 in 23. Does anyone know what this is? 
Can we all that? That is the tall, I'll tell you, that's the tallest tree in the world. It is uh, uh, 116 meters tall and is a slender ratio of 1 in 16. Yeah, 1 in 16. So until recently, we've not been able to match that. So we've never been able to harness the power of a tree. Or we're actually quite fussy. We like things not to move too much when we're in a building. So, so that's, that's, uh, when we take a tree apart, we never really manage to put it together in a way that's as good as it was, originally was. And let's, let's look at this one. This is uh, the Merschenet. I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, one in five and a half. I think that's pretty good, actually, for, for timber. I think that's, that's pretty good. Um, now, if we look at, again, engineer, I like numbers and charts. This is a chart. If I take a chart looking at the height of a timber building, and I then look at history and time, what, what's, what's that look like? This is illust illustrative purposes only. And um, we find that about 1,000 years ago, we built some medium-sized timber, 70, 70 meters or so. And then recently, we're starting to go up. Uh, and if we think of this as the present day, and in the future, we're probably, probably going to continue on a, on a the trend of building slightly taller and taller. Um, this is the building tower. This is the tallest per pergola in the world. It's nearly 70 meters. Has no metal fixings in it. Uh, so I'm I'm curious how that that is standing. And I think um, we forgot about this sort of technology over time. We moved on and, and moved into steel and concrete, and we didn't think. And this got left behind. And eventually, we've started to come on to. Uh, Realizing the value of timber and how we can we can engineer it again. So this, this is one of mine. This Dalton works. Um, well, when it was built, it was the tallest at the time. It still is the tallest CLT building in the UK. Keeping on to that title. Uh, and then currently we've got got the, the Mosque Um But I think that there's something to be said about actually looking back at technologies we've done before to move forward as well and seeing how how build these buildings behaved and how they were put together. Um, I'm not sure that matters so much. If we look at actually all of the buildings in the world, and you know, another chart. Buildings we've got low and high on that axis. And let's do another one. And then we're going to how many? So you've got few and many there. And we look at how that would potentially look. You've got a slope that looks like this. So we've got we've got high buildings, there's quite a few number of them, and then lots and lots and lots of many, many smaller buildings. Um, where, where does where does timber fit? Where, where does it where does it like to be at the moment? And it's in it's in that region. That's quite a lot. So that, that's a lot. There's a lot of potential to be building a lot of timber buildings. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, and that's say that's the say 150 mark, 150 meter mark. Um, there's a lot of uh, people looking to reach that mark in timber. I think that's great. That's fine. But you, you need to do that looking at it to break down perceptions so you can get access to do more here. And that's important because of this you know, sustainability. And uh, I've recently learned uh, a fact that you know, if we continue to burn carbon at the rate that we're doing this year or last year, that's the time we've got left to where we reach our quota of temperature increasing by uh, one and a half degrees. So it's quite, we need a lot of quick, urgent action to get that mass of buildings to be changed quickly into, say, timber, a more sustainable um, option. And timber is great because I think someone mentioned earlier about numbers on sequestration. Uh, you know, timber is a sponge. It does soak up all of that carbon uh, within the atmosphere. And if you're using it for managed forest, that's great because then it's replen replenished and it's going to grow, continue to grow some more. It is a 100% renewable material. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Why wouldn't you use more of it? And we apply those figures to um, a project we're looking at in, in the UK, to, which is looking to achieve a net zero carbon facility, um, looking at different structural options. So let's say um, a steel and concrete composite deck is uh, the next feasible option, maybe some steel and CLT. Um, timber with no sequestration, and then timber with sequestration. Um, just with having uh, the low in body carbon alone, it's reduced by 500 tonnes. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic saving. Um, take account into the sequestration as well, 
then it's an, almost an extra thousand tons. Um, so these are quite high numbers. That's just one building. So if, if we then think about all the buildings in the world, all the buildings in the world last year that were made in concrete um, produced a lot of CO2. And if only 75% if of them could have been timber, that would have saved around about uh, 1.5 billion tons of CO2. So there's, there's, there's certainly a need um, to do move across quite quickly. That's the message. Um, and we need to get the message across to developers and clients. And um, I think sustainability is probably not going to do it alone. So we need to have, have that sort of financial incentive as to why people should be using this material. So that kind of brings and uh, unlock the value that using such a uh, material can d achieve. Which brings me on to uh, Dalton Works. Uh, this is a building I worked on about five years ago uh, for a client in the middle in Hackney in London, and um, it, they were looking. They wanted. They had a site. They wanted to put on as many flats as possible, 122. And in the UK, you you do you break down your flats. You've got a certain number of private residential, which is here in blue. Um, you have some shared ownership along here, and then affordable rented spaces. And that's required for planning. And then in between these two blocks, we linked in a residential or a commercial office space. In terms of what the structure looks like, we've got timber resi from the first floor all the way up. And, it, and from that first floor podium, it's all timber. There's no, there's no steel, there's, no, there's some brackets and fixings, but there's no steel in between members um, or no, and no floor of concrete. And then there's timber offices, concrete floor, and there's a, a basement in there as well. Uh, one of the things with CLT is we want to have, have many walls. Many walls actually reduces the, the volumes because the spans with vibrations. Uh, so having, having lots of walls makes it more cost efficient. A um, bit more to lift, but it makes it work. Uh, on this one, we've also had a challenge along here, butting right up against an existing building. And the client want to maximize the use of the site, so they wanted to go as close to that as possible. Um, you can see it here. This is the bit that was demolished. This is the neighboring building. They didn't get on, actually, so he wasn't too impressed when he was putting something up against him, but you know, it was okay in the end. Uh, so we, we thought, oh, it's a bit hard. We, we haven't got any access to the side. He wants the space, but it, there's no physical access to the side of us. We had two options. One is we'll try and use the CLT panels and pre-clad them and see what the market would say, or B, there's a, a steel frame, and plan B, nobody really wants us to do, um, and thankfully, the market came back and said, we can do plan A. So, so why, why was this timber? Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, Hackney Council did have a slight preference for um, a timber <coughs> buildings uh, there, they, almost like a timber first policy to help them out. Um, but also um, the, the site constraints as well. So we had this site uh, where there are tunnels underneath it, and that, that building load meant that we needed to have a lightweight solution so that we weren't going to have issues with the tunnels were going to be there. Um, and which meant that CLT and timber were just a natural fit for what we wanted to do. But not only that, uh, if we were to do this in concrete, uh, the client wouldn't achieve the top floors because they would have been too heavy. That's 15 uh, apartments. Uh, apartments in Hackney today are probably going for half a million pounds. So, you know, that's a, a lot of money they would not have made. And it probably would have made the scheme unfeasible. But also, we were able to design it for an extra 20 flats in the future because the load difference was so great. So, 35 flat difference between the use of two different materials. Um, as a client, I think they were pretty happy with that. Um, a bit more about the engineering. Uh, CLT, especially CLT, has a lot of stability walls. So we, this is our sort of walls that we're able to use in red for our stability systems. Um, makes a bit of a nightmare to calculate, to be honest. Um, but, but it's worth it, because Timber, we like it, right? Um, then just a bit about how that kind of works. The, we don't want to build our building to deflect too much. So we end up with the connection stiffnesses. Connections are like springs in timber. They move and they flex. Um, with, with forces that are put onto it. 
Um, but so does also the timber and the, the way they're all connected. But this, this force here, this, this form of deflection that a building, building will have is about 50% of, of the overall um, contribution to the movement of the structure. So these bits were almost secondary. That's the bit that you got to focus on. And some of the, the highly stressed walls, we've had a, a lot of, lot of high-end bracketry fixing. I think, I think this is quite, quite, quite dumb, quite simple. I'm sure in time, you know, those, those proprietary brackets can become a lot, lot more clever. Um, I'm thinking back to those uh, buildings from a thousand years ago, and they actually only had timber, timber, timber dells, and that, they were quite clever. Um, anyone been to the UK? And here being to uh, up to the north. This is a picture I took about 10 years ago in, in a city called York. Uh, it's a street called The Shambles. And it was built several hundred years ago. And you can see all the buildings are just starting to move, move into each other, because timber, timber can move as well. Um, obviously, they didn't mind back then. You know, the facade might crack, but they just pave over it. Um, that's not an acceptable standard for today, unfortunately. So we have to think about um, uh, movement and how that occurs. And uh, certainly with Dalston, we were quite conscious we were doing platform construction, so we were loading the timber up in the bit that was as soft as, as possible. And so the trick is we needed to try and find a way of loads to uh, divert around the panels, which is quite simple, I suppose. Um, but looking at what that, that bit of squishiness would achieve, if we just do normal standard CLT construction, we would get a overall settlement. These, these charts, by the way, the, the thicker they are means the more downward settlement they, they get. So you end up with oh, um, about 60 odd mil of vertical settlement, which can cause problems with uh, your facade and lifts and the like. So we thought we, we need to stiffen up that little bit, either make them continuous or, or, or do something different. Uh, in the end, we thought we'd, we'd do it with uh, either some hardware dowels or what the contractor preferred ultimately was a, a grout fixing. Well, making that change um, of stiffening those bits and pieces up, change your, your settlement to something like that, which is pretty much a standard, what, what you'd expect for any sort of structure to move, just drop by 10 mil. So we did grout dowels, but we thought, well, actually, let's just, there's not a lot of information on this. Let's, let's test it. So we uh, asked Cambridge University, could you test some, could you squish some timber for us? And uh, they went, yeah, yeah, we'd love to squish some timber. And so this is them squishing some timber. Uh, and, and all the dots on here are measured so you can tell how much it's moved over time. So this is without any stiffening in, in, onto it. And you can see some nice failure modes where the, the timber is bulging out. I think if that was a longer panel, you might not get that, that sort of cracking on it. A bit more, a bit closer up, a bit more load. Different angle. Uh, and then let's do where we've put some grout issues in, because that's the contractor's preferred choice. Uh, how does that work? That got about five times higher. It really it, it outperformed what we thought it would do. It was much better. Um, interesting failure modes, the same kind of there. The grout fell out, but that wasn't what was going to happen in real life. Um, sort of brittle failure, local loads. Also broke the machine. You can see the, you see the, see what happened there? I am still on speaking terms with Cambridge, though, so they, they, they may not have been happy then, but they're okay now. That's just five years ago, right? Um, so uh, on site, some site pictures. This is the facade going up along here. Um, there's no need to tent it. We were able to have a water management plan in place. You can see the crane was in the middle of the loop um, to drop the CLT panels in place. Uh, and this scaffolding followed up afterwards. Uh, with the, the brick facade and, and some of the stiffening points. Um, lesson learned, the contractor who decided to go this way with the grout said, actually, I wouldn't do that again. I think it's a wet train. It's a bit messy. Um, we'd prefer not to, not to do that. So that's um, Dalton Works. I nearly completed a completed building uh, for about five minutes, the tallest timber building in the world, before a treat came along and smashed it out of the water, took, took, our, took our pride. So Dalton Works, the tallest timber building in the UK. Okay, um, so, so where, where do I think the, the future is going? I think quite like you guys, you guys are doing, I think modular is the, the future of doing, doing things off-site in the factory conditions. Uh, and that sort of opens up the role of what, what as consultants, 
All right, what, what sort of scope do we, do we want to be doing? Do you want to, because we can do a certain amount. And I think actually, when, when the thing comes down to doing modular, you know, our scope is, is it should be more um, and be more, more coordinated. Everything has to be precision accurate, like you'd expect. Um, but also, we can do more. We can do so much more. You know, we can componi componentize everything, make things nodes, and feed into fa factory conditions to help help um, our clients out. So this is an example of one of the connection nodes that were on um, one of our CLT modular buildings that we were doing. And we did the full connection design and model it in Revit and Nova. And we thought, well, let's let's just script that. We've got a node. We've got the, the capacity of that. We can create a code. To script that and place that in the right place. And um, once it's in the right place, we can cut the CLT around it, and that will create the model that can go to the factory. Um, so they found that quite useful. But also, we've put in all these metal nodes everywhere that we you know we can certainly schedule that out and create data sets and sheets. And um, it, so, for a factory condition, they'll they'll know which module they're running through the factory and which piece of metal, which piece of fixing they need to use and what they need to order in time. And this is quite a um, a step change, I think, for them. They were like, "Okay, that, this is this is good. We can we can go forward with that, um, and and it's worked quite well. And it's saving them a lot of money, a lot of time and energy, looking through the drawing information when they have just data sets and and they can filter down and drill down into where they need to go." Hmm, I've got a video. And then I thought, actually, maybe we can expand that out into not just a module, but into um, into a full-on uh, building. So this is a video, if it, if it does work, which is not. But what it, what it, what it is, sh what would show, is um, you can preset your designs to um, create, say, for Resi, different types of units that have then, okay, we can select this one, that is, a, is, is a current concrete building, but we want to make it our CLT. We'll tri drop down menu, select the CLT, how many stories is it going to be, 10, 15, and then it'll change it into a, a CLT unit. And then you can put the, apply that across the entire project. And it's the same, again, writing a script. I'm assuming that's not going to work. That's OK. Um, for uh, office office buildings as well. So we've, we've written um, or some scripts in development and looking at some user interfaces for uh, some clients in terms of, you know, how can we automate our office, if, say, um, can we select the height of it, uh, what sort of constraints, what's our drivers that, for the right material to use, uh, and end up with an output that starts to look something like this, where um, our building is almost done. Uh, we have a strategy, and we have the building we want, and then a design just pops out. So I think for the future, in terms of another chart, um, wh where we look, if this is our typical timeline in the UK, so our stages of design, and this is sort of the, ten the type of work that, that we as consultants would put in, and we generally have this sort of st slow start, ramp up in the middle, uh, get to an end of construction issue, and then taper off. I, I think that's going to change somewhere in the future to more of a, let's define the strategy, very little in the middle, because we can just make that and throw out the answer of what the building needs to be. But in the end, there's a, a detailed bit on an R&D element that helps feed back into that strategy. So maybe in the future, our, our stages look something a bit like, um, well, we just create the strategy, implement, do some detailed R&D, put those lessons from the R&D and, and, and implementation back into strategy and move on to the next building. Um, and that will free up our time to think about the, instead of doing the same things over and over again in, for the building, but actually think about the taller buildings and how we can be innovative and research and push things forward in, in, a, in a manner that will allow us to build more timber buildings to be more sustainable uh, in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, now it's a pause, uh, so uh, have some more coffee, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes, I think, and we'll continue with uh, the next speaker.
Okay, so our next speaker, Jessica Syber from Stora, uh, Stora Enso. <laughs> she will be talking about this material, LVL, among other, um, and especially showing a new um, project in Joenso in Finland, uh, Finland's tallest timber high rise. That's correct. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm happy to see so many new faces. So it means that uh, the word is, uh, is spreading. Uh, my name is Jessica Seiber. I work as a business development manager at Stora Enso. Uh, and the role is uh, 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 including a lot of strat strategic work to our business intelligence, but also a lot of client contact with non-buying customers, such as architects and structural engineers. To, uh, help, uh, to help them, uh, guide them into uh, choosing the right component, but also a lot of dialogue with uh, main contractors and uh, developers um, to make them comfortable uh, working with this material. Uh, and I am a, a civil engineer uh, from the Royal Institute of Technology from the beginning, and I am also certified project uh, management. Uh, leaders, so for me, uh, uh, wood is something uh, to speed up the process and make it more efficient. Uh, then it has a lot of other benefits as well, but for me it's, uh, it's uh, maybe something more square in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the agenda for, for today, I will present Stora Enzo as a company. Many of you might, uh, might know about the company, but maybe not that we're working towards the building industry. Uh, I will mention our product portfolio uh, and then uh, mainly focus on, uh, on the project Lighthouse in Joensuu. So Stora Enso is a Swedish-Finnish uh, forest industry uh, group and we have been around for 700 years, so for a very long time. Uh, we have uh, operations in, on four continents in 30 countries and we're about 26,000 employees at the moment. We are available at the Helsinki and Stockholm Stock Exchange market. Um, and we're divided into these five divisions uh, and together we have a turnover uh, of about uh, 10 billion euros each year. And each year we put 1% of our turnover, which in Swedish crowns is uh, 1 billion euros, no, 1 billion Swedish crowns, uh, on research and, and innovation, just to, uh, uh, to uh, stay in the forefront in developing new renewable materials. Because the vision is that we can replace uh, and uh, offer competitive alternatives from the fossil-based materials, but also for the non-renewable materials. I work at the division in the middle, uh, which is called wood products, with the bespoke materials <coughs> called CLT and LVL. Uh, so you heard about cross-laminated timber. Uh, but for this talk, I will mainly focus on the other product, which is called uh, laminated veneer lumber because it's uh, perhaps not that known uh, here in the Swedish market at the moment. Um, and we have been around for 700 years, but uh, working towards the uh, building industry, we're done for uh, about 15 years, <laughs> so not that long. Uh, but we did do a lot of projects. We have delivered uh, CLT, uh, and or LVL to over 18,500 projects worldwide so far. Um, we have um, four production units. Uh, they are all in Europe. Two of them are in Austria. One is in Sweden and one is in Finland. And we are working on a feasibility study uh, to build another uh, CLT mill in the Czech Republics. Uh, we are a material supplier of CLT and LVL components. We are one of the biggest in the world and we are market leader in the European market. Uh, all the wood is certified according to PEFC or FSC. Uh, and this you can choose uh, as, a, as a client, whichever you want. Um, and uh, 
in, within the building solutions, uh, we're not really talking about the products of CLT and, and LVL, we're talking about components. Because you can use these uh, products uh, uh, at, uh, at the same places, so to say. So we're trying to help the non-buying customers and also the customers to choose the right component at the right place. Uh, and uh, how are we doing this? Uh, we have creating a lot of concepts, uh, mainly regarding residential projects, uh, but uh, the latest one was presented in November last year, uh, and it was an office concept. Uh, where Alan and his uh, team helped to help to, de to develop uh, the recordings of the of the launches available on site, so you can check it out and listen to Alan some more, <laughs> and also me. Uh, and the next one coming up that we will launch is the Echo School concept, and it's during Q2 this year. Um, And also for, uh, for the non-buying customers, for the, uh, for the architects, we are in a collaboration with a uh, program called Prodlib, where we have different build-ups. So you can drag and drop the BIM into your BIM model with, with the build-ups so you can reach the building regulations, which is outside the superstructure of the building. So how you reach the acoustics and fire and so on. And for the engineers, uh, we have a web-based uh, calculation tool called Calculatis, which is free to use. And for the contractor, we have an application to simplify the logistics on site uh, and make it uh, quicker, but also much safer when you uh, install the superstructure. This one. Yeah, but I was asked uh, here to talk mainly about LVL, so I will be this log lady from Twin Peaks now and bring this out. Uh, LVL is, um, is based on the technique of peeling, so what we're doing is that we uh, put a log of tree into water and then we peel a sheet that's about three millimeters thick, and this sheet uh, we glue together uh, in 90 degrees angles. And uh, how many sheets that are uh, glued together depends on what uh, you want to achieve with this element. So that's LVL in, in short. It's a lightweight material and it's even lighter than CLT. So depending on what, what, your, what your demands for your project uh, are, uh, this could be the product for you. This can also replace glue lamp uh, and make it into something like a thinner beam. Uh, and it's the same, it could, uh, could uh, be instead of a concrete pillar uh, or uh, a steel beam, for instance. Uh, but not to talk <laughs> too much about the product, I will talk about two components that we recently launched. Uh, one is called the LVL ribbed panels, which is used for uh, floors and roofs uh, with medium and long spans. So if you have a project with a roof that's about 20 meter span, this might be the product for you. And the same if you have, uh, have a floor that's about 13.5 meters. You can use three different build-ups uh, of these uh, wooden cassettes. The LVL uh, G uh, is also used in the project that I will talk about more uh, soon. Uh, and it's actually, the G stands for re-glued. So we're doing it as thick as possible and then we're taking two of these plates and glue it together. And then we're getting this LVL G. Uh, we can use it for load-bearing walls, but also uh, for posts and beams in a building frame. Uh, the maximum size is about 60 square meters, and that's provided or divided by 315 times 16.5 uh, meters. So they're uh, very big panels, although you have to con take in consideration with the logistics, so it's also cost efficient and you don't have to have uh, special transport. Uh, but now over to the project. <laughs> uh, this is a unique solution when, uh, where we use both CLT and LVL. 
Um, and that's why it also won this design competition. The LVL factory is actually only 120 kilometers from this town, Juenso, in Finland. But mem maybe not all of you <laughs> know where Juenso is, so I have a map here. Um, and uh, the, the site is situated by the harbor, where it used to be an old sawmill. But the whole area is under, uh, let's say, uh, they're building other stuff there <laughs> now. Uh, so this is part of this uh, uh, change of the area. Uh, the project itself is a student housing project. It's 14 floors. Uh, the first floor is in concrete, but the, uh, the rest of the 13 floors uh, are uh, only made with wood. Uh, there's no underground spaces uh, in this project. Um, and uh, since we have so many different, uh, let's say, professions in this room, I would like to, to mention a little bit about the ecosystem around this project. Uh, the architectural uh, design was made from a, a quite well-known uh, company. The structural engineer, this was not their first uh, wooden project, uh, and they have uh, several, uh, several more that they're working with now because this project got a lot of uh, PR. The main contractor <laughs> only did uh, a few low-rise building up to two floors in wood before going into this one. So it de depends how risk-taking you are, <laughs> but it, uh, it went well. Uh, and we are also uh, now collaborating with them in other projects. So it's, uh, it's a good uh, uh, story to, to build on. Since it's uh, popular to talk about LCA, I will also mention a little bit about this, uh, because this project was uh, uh, chosen to be the official uh, pilot uh, from a project called Levels, which is an indicate, uh, and how we did it was that we, uh, the whole, uh, let's say, uh, scope of the project is to use a tool to inform about embodied carbon in uh, in uh, in a project, and Stora Enso used this levels tool uh, as an indicator. We connected it to the BIM model, and then we connected it to our EPD, which is the environmental declaration uh, for the product. Uh, the key findings of this study uh, is the European Commission uh, that uh, created this tool called Levels. Uh, and uh, the, the purpose is to report the framework to demonstrate the carbon emission reduction during the construction and carbon storage throughout the lifespan. Um, there is a, a good report that's not that, uh, that thick. <laughs> it's only eight pages that you can, uh, you, you can read. I don't know if you distribute the, the presentations afterwards, but if you do, that's fine with me. Uh, you can use the link or you can just search for it. But the conclusion was that this uh, lighthouse uh, project in Juenso, uh, the life cycle embodied carbon balance shows that the carbon stored in the wood products that is used for this project uh, equals 88% of the embodied carbon in use of all the construction projects. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, result, so to say. Uh, uh, but if you're, if you're having uh, other projects in the pipeline, there is this free uh, tool called L LCA. Dot Wait, what's it called? OneClickLCA.com. And there you can kind of upload your BIM model, and then it could do this kind of check also. So that's, that's good to use. Um, some technical specifications. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are from Finland, but uh, having this air raid shelter of concrete, this is mandatory in Finland. So that's why also the first floor is in concrete. 
uh, they are uh, well aware of their neighbors, so, uh, so this is how it works in Finland. But uh, all the rest of the floors are, uh, are made with, uh, with CLT and LVL. Um, <coughs> the sound reduction was 55 uh, decibels, so that's like normal in Finland as well. Um, and uh, the piling work started in February 2017, and the framework for installation started in May, and people moved in during uh, September 2018. So it was a quite uh, quick uh, project in, in that sense. Uh, the fire requirements were uh, a bit special here. Uh, they did not have <laughs> a standardized a way of working in, uh, with this kind of tall buildings in Finland. So it was uh, uh, R19. Uh, it had to be sprinklers uh, and uh, the fire requirements are actually uh, tougher to achieve in Finland than uh, in uh, Norway and Sweden. So uh, there are no visual wood inside uh, this house. Uh, everything is cladded with gypsum board. And just for you to get an idea of how the project looks, uh, the first floor is to my right. Uh, and there are, of course, two public saunas there. Uh, and the other one is the standard uh, floor plan from 2 to 14. And if it's the same uh, as, as a building with with another material, if you have more or less the same floor plan, it's easier to optimize the, uh, the load uh, calculations. And so we did here as well. Um, what else? It to in total, it's 117 apartments. There's uh, 91 studios and uh, 26 one-room apartments. And they vary from 26 square meters to, okay. Okay, to 47 square meters. Uh, there's one elevator, uh, two corridors, and two staircases. Uh, when this, uh, when when uh, the structural engineer optimized this, they chose LVLG instead of CLT in the walls, um, and also how to kind of make it as thin as possible because you don't take the same load the higher you you go in the, in the project. Um, the biggest wall element here was 41 square meters, so it was 13.2 meters times 3.1 meter. Uh, the wall height is uh, 3.06 meters, but the, the total uh, floor to floor was 3.1 meter. Uh, here's the calculation uh, <laughs> that was uh, more or less resulted into using LVLG uh, for, for the walls. Uh, because when you're using, uh, in, in this case, when you used LVE, you, uh, LVLG, uh, you get thinner walls, which makes it into more floor space, but you still have the same uh, 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 footprint from the building. Uh, the span for uh, for the rooms were about six to four to six uh, meters, which makes it perfect to use CLT. And the CLT slabs were between 100 and 220. So uh, it was not overdimensioned. <laughs> uh, a lot of other speakers have, have talked about uh, what will happen when you build high with the uh, lightweight material. Uh, for this project, uh, it was used. Uh, uh, the solution was to use this post uh, tension stress bars, and what we did was that we pre-drilled this 40 millimeters uh, thick hole in the LVL uh, G walls, and we did it from top to bottom. It was the first time we we did it. It went well, <laughs> so we will probably do it again. Uh, but yeah, the the. It, it goes all the way down, so it's a very special, uh, 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 special solution in that sense. 
Yes, and then some pictures during construction, so it will be a little bit more hands-on, because hopefully you're hands-on people and not just going around to these seminars. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, what, th what the main contractor did was that they had, even though this, the site was uh, uh, quite tight, uh, they did uh, uh, create an uh, 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 unsigned tent uh, where they did all the build-ups on the uh, exterior walls. So with the cladding, the glazing, and the facade and so on. And this made them uh, also uh, quite fast in the production because when it was raining and snowing, uh, and also it was a heavy wind, they didn't have, it, it's problematic to do the, the lifts. Uh, and then they, all the uh, site guys could, could work on cladding the, the walls instead. Um, here are some more pictures of this. Uh, so off-site is also good, but uh, it's also, uh, yeah, you have to think about the logistic because you're moving a lot of, of volume to a new place <laughs> and then to, to the third place. Um, also, uh, yeah, this is some other pictures might not look that nice, but inside it was cladded anyways. <laughs> so no worries about that. Uh, we did the, the main contractor did not use scaffolding because of this technique. Uh, they only used the crane. So it was also uh, lowering the cost in that sense. Uh, and also avoiding working on, uh, yeah, on heights. Um, for this project, uh, uh, we have delivered CLT stairs, which is uh, quite normal these days for projects. And we have also done the stairs and the elevator shaft in CLT for, for the Mjöss tornet. Uh, so we're, we're also part of that project. Uh, here they uh, used LVL uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the lift shaft. And we also have a handbook just regarding the stairs and the lift shafts, uh, just to find the right technique for your kind of uh, project. And I don't know how I am about time, but let's... Okay. Uh, this uh, project uh, won the Finnish National Wood Award uh, last year. So uh, it was a success story in that, uh, in that matter as well. And I did ask Florian if he would talk about this, because this is one of the projects that we're collaborating with. Uh, Store Enso is a main sponsor uh, to uh, the additional dome that will be built by uh, the National Museum of Science and Technology here in Sweden. Uh, Robert did not win this competition. <laughs> it was Elding Oskarsson that were chosen. Uh, and Florian has... Uh, had a cool idea of creating a grid shell of LVL. And then uh, uh, the pillars will be in LVLG and the dome will be in CLT. So we are very excited <laughs> to see this uh, being realized. It's now, uh, yeah, they're working uh, quite a lot with it. Uh, and hopefully the production will start the summers this year and you can come and visit at the end of next year. Uh, yeah, that's it. And I'm here for later talks. And if you have some projects, I'm the go-to person at Stor Enso. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. Uh, yes, no, I did not win that competition. Hopefully you give me another one to try. <laughs> So, uh, our last um, speaker this evening, Aaron, as it turned out to be, do we have his presentation? No, not yet. Okay, Florian, reveal yourself and get us your uh, USB. <laughs> uh, I don't have an USB. Did you, I sent you an email. Okay. Oh, shit. Uh, okay, uh, that may be the same thing. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Um, or do you want to talk a little bit more? Skal vi köra ny? Yes. 
okay, I speak English because my Norwegian is uh, not always so easily understood. Um, and we, I, I want to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of, so it may go very fast. And maybe that is also a way to keep uh, the attention up. If it's too fast, please say so. Uh, first of all, we are structural engineers. That's very important to point out because sometimes that is not so clear, but we want to be structural engineers and that, that is our core interest. Um, we have been involved in a lot of projects. Um, it started basically with the Holm uh, ski jump somewhere, and it is uh, moving timber, the old Viking ships. We have been almost everywhere, all materials, everything. Uh, we, we, after looking back at our projects uh, a year ago, we decided it is idea-based engineering. There's no specialization in one topic or another. It is just have a good idea, have a bad idea, and discuss them. That can con uh, give extreme cantilevers, buildings with, with extreme uh, setups. This almost no columns, and the, the, the owner is very happy because he, he, he got this extreme experience of space when entering his building, adding them to the market value. This was built 2010, 11, and it was the first time I was investigating uh, CLT on huge square meters, 100,000 uh, square meters uh, in CLT. So that's about 10 years ago. Back then it was not deemed feasible, but we thought we had a much better solution. Uh, in the meantime, there's studying, experimenting in uh, CLT, um, uh, using the CLT as a uh, load-bearing wall, like we used to. This is where CLT is very, very useful, in the facade on the outside. Uh, we do a little bit uh, or very much refurbishment, let's come back to that, uh, making old buildings fly and building a new cellar under it. And uh, this is the, the extreme level we, we sometimes go to, no cracks in the existing structure. That's what we do. Uh, we are also moving old timber, so we are doing material uh, investigations. Uh, the Viking ships in Oslo, they need to be moved into a new part of the building, working with very old timber. Uh, very exciting, very very different, let's say. We are also very proud of this thing here. That is a bridge, 46 meter span, 20 millimeter thick, not in timber. And um, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is just, it, this is unbelievable. Somehow it touches people because they see it is not possible, but when they walk over, it becomes totally natural and it, it fits into the scenery, into the landscape. And, and, and that is an interesting effect of ideas and, and structural engineering. And um, I'm a little bit uh, tired uh, because we are delivering this project here, very extreme from, from an engineering perspective. That's an extension of the, um, the hospital in Nuuk in Greenland that we're doing together with White, where everything is in CLT, the re oh, glue lamp CLT, uh, everything we, we can find. The reason is they need to transport it to Greenland, need to put it in uh, containers, and this is a very efficient way of doing that. Short construction time uh, out there, and, and yeah, we'll see how that works out. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> um, there are a lot of schools, different directions. Uh, we don't know whether building uh, structure uh, where they develop into, what they evolve into. Uh, is it pure timber? Is it a combination? Is it mixes? Uh, we, we are a little bit fascinated of hybrid structures. And that came not as an idea. It came a little bit out of... Um, these are high-rise timber buildings in Norway. And when this one came up, it was uh, very stunning but they use these extra skeleton diagonals, uh, structural systems which I find are not very uh, suitable for these kind of buildings. So you have this diagonal here, huge diagonals, and, and they, and e extreme columns here in the corner, and this is where you want to have the best view. Who's want to sell? This doesn't fit. And, and th that, that here made me a little bit frustrated. And, and here again, the same thing, um, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so came this one. And, and, and that frustration that could unload here. 
because um, there the task was use timber. This was 2015, use timber, we don't care. Fine, that's fine. Let's, let's just do that and no limits to that. And, and somehow we went into the architectural competition just saying, we, there is no limit to timber, just use it as you want to use it. And it developed into this, what I believe, very timber building, but doesn't need to be a timber building. It is, uh, it is much more about urban space. It's a lot about architecture, as far as I understand it. And it is people get attracted to it. And it, it in my mind, advocates timber in, in, a, in, a, in a much better way. So what did we push? You see there's a high tower here. There's all these low um, areas. Y this is about 160 meters by, or 100, I don't really remember, and by 60 meters. So this is not a building. This is a whole city quarter we're building here in Timber. In a complexity that, um, you know, there's these Rixsäne, there's uh, office, there is uh, house, no, there's the, the, the hotel, there is conference, there is library, there's everything. There's even a, a little workshop and, and the complexity that comes with that and that you want to use timber to, to, to build that is, is really fascinating, was very fascinating to me. But back to the anger, um, we, I, I mean no diagonals, that's, that's a good rule. So what we did is we tried to use the CLT cores on the sides of the building uh, to stiffen the whole building. We, we did not, uh, when we go this extreme, we usually say, okay, this is a plan, but we also have a plan B so that people don't get too nervous. Plan B would be here, concrete. We can always switch over to concrete, and then somehow this, this, uh, this fear or this, I mean, there is a, a, a client who wants to spend a lot of money, and he needs to have a high degree of uh, certainty that what we are going to propose will actually work. So it is how to nego negotiate that uh, discussion. Uh, we made the CLT cores. They are not cut between the levels. It's long panels that are stacked on top of each other, overlapping each other, glued together up to 400 millimeters, 415 I think it is, uh, thick. And that is one of the first sketches. So this is the vertical load bearing stiff, uh, system. In between, we put um, C uh, CLT boxes, uh, prefabricated hot, uh, hotel modules, which nobody would stack um, 13, 14 floors back then. And we just, okay, let's put a column, a timber column in the corner of the module, put them on top of each other, and it'll work. It seems to work. So there, there is not really a limit. Uh, then we are, we want to have, uh, out of architectural reasons, we want to have this, this huge foyer. And the, the columns that they would need to go down here, that is not acceptable. And it, you then can start a discussion about, yeah, I want to build everything in timber, but no, um, the columns, that's not okay. And now the question is, do you want to use the building or do you want to build a timber building? And I think, this is much more building a building than, yeah, it's also in timber, but that's cool. And uh, so we added a little bit of uh, steel here in between. Maybe this could have also been solved in, in concrete, but I was a little bit stressed at those days, uh, so I did not push it there too much. So you take all the forces that come down, take them in the steel and put them to the side again on timber columns. So this, this steel piece here is just a, yeah, in between thing. Um, this is the analysis model. What we do also a few tricks here. Uh, we connect it to these huge uh, Rixsäne, and uh, so we get a little bit less uh, uh, movement. Uh, it was also very smart that something we did it right from the beginning to put those cores on the outside to the gable walls. Not traditionally you would put them to the inside uh, of the building because they usually obstruct uh, the view. That was not necessary here. And that was smartly solved uh, between architecture and, and, and structure, which, which um, I think is, is some of the beauties in, in this project. And then we build models and you know the, the drill, everything. This is more uh, 
it's actually been, we did not finish the project. We went until the tender documents and then it was taken over by uh, local uh, engineers. But from what I hear, it seems to develop into these directions. There's a few issues which I want to talk about, but yeah, this is one of them. Uh, we have this issue with high buildings and lateral movements. We call them wind-induced uh, uh, movements. And it is basically the, the wind hitting the building, the building starts moving, which is fine, it's not a problem. But when the accelerations get too big, people get uncomfortable. You have heard about this. In timber buildings, this happens a little bit earlier in terms of height. In concrete, 300 meters is not a problem. In timber, that, that starts a little bit earlier. And um, so there was a lot of talk about that. There's a lot of requirements. There's often li the lift is governing, because if the lift is, uh, can't move because there's too much movement, that can actually govern the, the situation. These are rules, uh, too much engineering for the time being. Um, but I want to talk about this one. If we're talking about tall buildings, this is a little equation which tries, which it's not really honest uh, equation. It's more to show you what are the main drivers to achieve this comfort criteria, which is governing the design. Uh, it is acceleration <coughs> here. Uh, that's what you feel. People are very sensitive to other accelerations, extremely sensitive. Uh, the worst is sidewise, vertical is also. And um, that is governed by mass, the, the mass of the building or the mass you want to excitate. So this is moving. There's little mass and wrong eigenfrequency. Then the stiffness, which drives the eigenfrequency. And damping. Damping is, when does it stop to move? It damps down. Now, all the three together need to be somewhere. They are not added up, they're multiplied. That means if I have no mass, you can have a lot of stiffness and a lot of damping, but still you will be able to excitate that. You understand that? It's like, like with the vitamins, you need a little bit of everything. And the, the mass is, um, is in timber buildings relatively low. So there's, the wind can, can take the building relatively easily because the building has little in inertia. The stiffness is, can also be lower uh, because we have this, the timber is in principle equally stiff as, as concrete, but be very careful with this one. It depends on how the orientations of the timber are, how the connections are, and so on. The damping is a very, we know what it means mathematically, but there's very little experience about damping in timber, uh, tall timber buildings. We just haven't built them enough. We don't know enough of that. So the damping has a huge effect on, on, on the other ones and it's, it's difficult to predict. So we used very conservative, uh, let's say high rise in, in, in concrete. You, if you are lucky, you get 1% damping, usually they're between 0.5 and 0.75. We used 0.5, very conservative, and made it work somehow. Now, um, the later development of the project, they added another level, as far as I understand. And, but this is a little bit hearsay, so I haven't been involved, so I don't really know. And the, the buildings that I've shown you from Norway, they use concrete levels in the upper floors to add mass which I find is cheating. I'm into the hybrids. Yes, that's fine, but that is too much. And the, the, the reason is they use the, the concrete to, to increase the weight, and then they tell you, oh, you know, that is, by the way, that is really fantastic because actually it, it takes acoustic uh, reduction too. So I don't have so many problems with that in timber. And I, I find this argument is, is not yet developed enough. So. When, we, when I look back into the discussions that we had, I would go this way, damping, and steer damping. This is the latest technology in high-rise, ultra-high-rise. It is um, dampers that get amplified. The dampers that ampl get amplified, they have about, we've said 0 0.5, they can do 6%. They can do 8%. This technology is available in the steel and concrete world. 
it has not been used in, in the timber world because the timber world comes a little bit from the other side. It comes from the little timber buildings. It does not yet know these technologies. And this is what I would push in the next project. That, that's something I learned. And um, they're fantastic mechanisms, extremely effective, cost little, reduce material because you don't need so much stiffness and not so much mass. And guess what that is? CO2. Yeah. Um, this one here is not a timber tower. This is a competition we won in, in Norway, uh, Norway, Norway's highest building, 250 meters. Um, it is, uh, it's Wingards. Um, the important thing here is not necessarily the project, but the attitude uh, they, the client developed to the project. So he is Shell uh, Ingerecke, uh, one of the richest people in Norway, and he wasn't really interested in this environmental story. He had heard that too many times. He said, you know, I want substance. I want something that I can prove and document. If this has an effect, I will go for it. But you need to be, you, you can't tell me just, oh, yeah, it's a green tree and it stands tall. Yes, I know all these things, but what does it mean? So that comment I took a little bit seriously. It was also the 2018 summer, which was a super warm summer, and everybody got nervous about the climate. Me too. So I wanted to know and started investigating this. What does CO2 actually mean? What do you know actually about it? We know that um, the the... 50% of all the CO2 has been produced in, in now was it uh, China, United States, <laughs> India, 50%. And all the other states have 50% too. So if you want to reduce 50% of this carbon, you turn off these states, or everybody, or anybody else, or everybody needs to cut 50%. But this is what we're talking about. So how could we, as professionals, contribute to that? And what does our contribution mean in that context. And so I started asking questions. Yeah, here is Norway. It has 0.11% of the uh, CO2. Uh, Sweden, 0.11. Funny, Sweden has double the amount of uh, uh, people that live there, inhabitants, than Norway, though they have the same CO2 footprint. This is one thing that you need to keep in mind. The Norwegians, they produce oil, and that is a very CO2 intensive business, which drags everything down. The Chinese, they produce all our goods. That's one reason why they have such a high footprint, and they use uh, bad energy. If you look at the, the graphs, how often do you see them? How, how often do you try to understand what is really going on? And um, pick your charts get into it. It's a funny game. It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, so we did look into it a little bit. I don't want to go into details here. Um, you know, it's like in the 1850s and it happens in the 1950s and then goes boom. No end in sight. Um, we know all about that. Amazingly, China is a big producer now. But if you look up, uh, through the integral, so how much has actually been produced? The US and Europe, including Russia, are the same. <coughs> Over the years, they have produced so much CO2. China's actually not that big because they just recently started. But they have, a, yeah, India is quite big and the Middle East is big. Do you know what your carbon footprint is? Um, United States, you know, this is actually going down. It's been going down for a while. If you look at uh, Sweden here, it was 12 tons per person. So. One Swede equals 12 tons per person in the 80s or so. Then it went down. Norway did the same thing, but not all the way. China started. China is now between Sweden and Norway. Here you see that a Norwegian has a much higher footprint than a Swede. And it's related to all the CO2 emissions that you have in one country that gets counted. So if you give that CO2 away by uh, giving oil to somebody else, it's not counted with them, but they, yeah, I would just more the production. Okay, but the principles are United States, but China, Norway, the, the worst are the Arab countries, and it's about 34 tons per person. Now, bear that in mind, you, 
in Sweden are about four tons CO2 per person. I think it's a very important number to, to remember because you can relate to it in, in all the decisions that you make. Uh, same uh, story. What is this distributed? This is US distribution. Transportation, buildings, heating of buildings. Transportation, heating of buildings. There's some fuel combustion, there's some industry, the agricultural sector, and so on. Salmon, 2.2%. Chemicals, 8.5%. Commercial buildings, 12%. Residential, 15%. That's heating of buildings. And the, here is, is transport, the road, 31%. So the big drivers are these here. And that was a little bit frustrating because if you look at the building, these are the cost drivers in a building. You have the architectural content, you have the structural engineering content. This is what it is price-wise. However, when you look at CO2 emissions, this is the structure. So, and this is the architectural stuff, so not so much. But the, the big part is the structure. If you then look how little money you spend here, it doesn't really, I, I mean, you could double this one. It has only a little effect on the end price, but you could maybe halven this, uh, this here, the CO2 emission. I think it is very, very important to put these numbers that we produce into a perspective. And then uh, this was after we've done, uh, we've been finished with Shelefteon. and we want to basically know what are we doing here? Is that that we um, that we produce a building completely in timber? What relevance does that have? What does that mean? So, um, uh, okay, this is maybe a bad slide, but we fit it in anyway. This is concrete. What happens on the concrete front? In, in Norway, there's a discussion, or you can order carbon-reduced concrete. Cuts off carbon em emissions by 40%. Is still a carbon emitter, but cuts it off by 40%. Uh, if you ask me, that sh that's the only concrete you should be using around anyway. And that it's actually not that expensive. Costs about 100, 150 crowns more per square meter, no, per cubic meter. But it improves the 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 uh, the CO2 of the con of the concrete a lot. I'm not saying we should be building concrete. It's just a fact to keep in mind. We are pushing all our contractors now to use this stuff, hands on. Because this slide here is a little bit older. It's, it's super interesting. It shows us span, very interesting for for structural engineers, and CO2 emittance. We see all the timber stuff down here, very low emittance of, of CO2. This doesn't even take into account storage of CO2. Then we have the prefab stuff, all these Hülldecke, whole bulk and, and precast sections. They span quite a lot, uh, up to 25 meters, and their CO2 profiles are actually not that bad. Then we have the standard concrete. This is a concrete with normal con uh, concrete, and it is basically the worst you can get. The, you have the bubble deck, which is supposed to be a reduction in CO2. It is, but uh, you need additional rebars in to, to hold those bubbles down, so you use a little bit the effort. If you get from concrete here to concrete there, this is without the CO2, and this is a lo lo low carbon uh, concrete, that's, that's a substantial reduction. Now, the timber effect, I believe, has a very positive effect on the, on the uh, concrete world because now they need to push themselves down. So that's quite interesting. Um, so, oh, there's one slide missing. Because what we did is we went into, or is it here? No, sorry. Uh, we started to calculate what does this <coughs> difference from concrete here to concrete here mean. And we calculated that 5%, um, no, 2% of all Norwegian uh, buildings are being rebuilt each year. It's about 2%, that's the turnover rate. If we, that is about four and a half million square meters of uh, timber. If we would build all these square meters in timber, how much would we reduce the CO2 footprint? 
Does anybody have a feeling? The very frustrating part is we calculate it to 1 to 2 percent. It's actually very, very little. That doesn't mean it is the best thing that we have, but it means something else in addition. It means uh, building in timber, we need to do that, but we cannot say that this will save the world alone. There's many, many other things that need to be done too. If that timber gets uh, transported in with low CO2 emitting cars and trucks and so on, we will be much better off. This will even improve the situation for the timber. And, and so on. It is the transport cost that needs to go down. It is the, the heating that needs to go down. And based on these um, understandings, we try to come up with um, what, what should we advise? We, we are uh, responsible for, for our advices. And I can't, I, what I said is improve energy performance of existing buildings. That is not so really hot topic. It's maybe also not where you make a lot of money, but it is helpful to reduce the CO2 carbon footprint. Generally, reduce amount of materials. If we can use half the amount of timber, that's also a reduction. We can use that other half amount of timber to build more houses in timber. That's a very important point. Um, reduce amount of materials. I think the CLT is fantastic for shafts and so on. I do like the LVL. The LVL is much smarter because it's stronger and you can use less timber per square meter, which allows you to build more in timber reduce the amount of materials. Local prefabrication, uh, short transport, absolutely important. This, the, the timber uh, uh, availability is improving in Scandinavia. Uh, five years back, it was hard to get enough timber for the Schleftio project. Now new companies are popping up and new uh, facilities are popping up. We say a high timber content, very important, but it is not the highest ranking in, in this, this is our strategy. And, but we, we think this is the best we have for the time being, but we need to understand the context. Reduce fossil fuels on construction sites. The, in, in Norway, there's a big push to use uh, electric uh, uh, equipment, everything, from, from the, the, the uh, truck to the digger, everything electrical. Um, understanding global climate gas emissions. This is what I was trying to, to tell you, or, or in this um, lecture a little bit to, to you have the responsibility too. So we need to ask the right questions and understand what does CO2 actually mean. It's like your bank account. It's, it's like other things that are very natural here. What does uh, and how can we reduce the CO2 emissions as best as possible? And if you understand the bigger picture, I think it is easier to ask the right questions and make the right decisions down the line. The frustrating part is that uh, for the time being, and this is also a little bit the conclusion here, if we can't do so much with all this, who can? And that would be politics. And I'm not a politician and I have no, uh, but I start understanding that uh, putting all these topics onto the political ad agenda, which is happening right now, is one important way uh, to move forward. Um, yeah, based on this one, we have done a new competition because we learn through competitions. We do new architecture competition and then we find something new, test that out and, and go all in. This client here, uh, that was uh, a competition with White, uh, the plus one project in uh, Gothenburg, extending the Svenska Varemesse. And um, the client did not ask for an environmental pro uh, profile. And th that is in these days difficult to understand with what we know. So um, we try to sell him what is really important here. And uh, the, the highest CO2 co content is in the slabs. If you can fix the slabs, you have done a lot already. And so yet there you can put a lot of timber in and then the rest we maybe we'd put in a concrete core or in this case, you see it, this evolved a little bit. We started using the facade and suddenly we are back to these diagonals in the facade, 
but in a totally different way. And um, so, first being a little bit, um, couldn't understand my Norwegian colleagues, but now I'm also back into that business. <laughs> but uh, I feel it uh, looks a little bit nicer, and then you suddenly can go up uh, 130, 140. It gives also other uh, possibilities. Uh, we also have no exposed timber here. There's also an architectural discussion, which I find is quite smart. On such a high building, you cannot change the facade easily. It's too risky. So they cladded it, and it becomes a nice part of, of the, the city. And, and, uh, but inside, there's a lot of timber. And we give them these grades of timberedness, because this is what they can understand. Then, ah, oh yeah, maybe this one, and then maybe we push in the last one. Unfortunately, we didn't win. And uh, yeah, but this is a little bit the strategy that we do these days. So uh, this is the result, and I think it's um, quite nice. This, this stuff here is not my fault. Uh, that is beautifully rendered by white, so <laughs> please ignore that. And uh, we had this, and uh, you know, it, it's so funny sometimes in these design processes. This is a regular grid, but sometimes it breaks the regular rhythm, and I can't see tell you where, and, uh, where is it? Da, there, for example. And that was actually by mistake, because, you know, when you um, make all these models all the time, it's not so easy to, to change them all equally uh, all the time. But then uh, there were some mistakes, and that made it actually beautiful. So, uh, fantastic. And, and uh, so learning by accident is, is, is good. But unfortunately, it uh, did not go all the way, but uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope uh, this was interesting. Thank you, Florian. And uh, by the way, that was our little secret. Which I'll one? be telling about the irreg irregularity in the facade. Uh, and then, uh, okay, no. So there was a mistake. <laughs> uh, now it's a <laughs> panel discussion. It's going to be moderated by Ricardo. So welcome up. Give him an applaud. And all you other guys, uh, presenters, take, take your seat. Yeah. And uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, but we, I think we'll fix this quite quickly. Thank you. Uh, do we have everyone here? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ricardo. I co-chair the Future Leader Committee of the CPUH uh, Scandinavia. And um, thank you very much for all of your presentation. They were all very inspirational. Now it's the fun part because you haven't prepared this, so I've got the uh, honor to put you on the spot. Let's see how do you react to this. Um, so I will, uh, would very much love this to be a collaboration with the audience uh, and you guys. So I'm gonna open up very quickly to you if you've got uh, some questions. If you don't, I can uh, start it very slowly and then uh, ignite your uh, curiosity. But I see one question over there. Yes, we do. Yeah, go, go. I can go around. Okay. Just stand up. Yeah. Show your team your seat control. Thank you, everybody. It was really amazing presentations. My name is Casper, and I'm from Rambo. And I was just uh, discussing here with my colleagues uh, during the, the break regarding uh, fire pr protection systems. Uh, so let's say if one has a sprinkler system, and in case of fire, uh, buildings made in concrete, in brickwork, um, there is not as much damage of, uh, in case of a fire made from the water as there would be in a, in a timber building. So is it re realistically possible to replace damaged uh, parts or pieces in a timber building after a fire that have been uh, soaked with, with moisture, I mean water? And uh, if yes, how would one do that? We have a question for everyone in the specific. Whoever knows. Florian? We have no experience with that. I, I think. <laughs> 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 Uh, and nobody has put such a building into the... Re there, there is... Uh, buildings in smaller scale have been tested. And um, yes, timber is a burning, uh, burnable material, combustible material. The standard thinking in a concrete steel building is that the building will burn out at some point, stop burning. 
uh, the building is then also destroyed because uh, the concrete will fall apart uh, in large areas. It, it will also be very hard to, to uh, repair that. The same with columns, uh, steel columns that will be bent in all kinds of directions. So there is no absolute security against these failures. In a timber building is no exception from, from that rule. But um, to me, uh, this question is about security and safety is is, is very, very important, but it also needs to be seen in a realistic picture, in a realistic scenario. If we get all the people out, then that is the most important thing. And here, timber has sufficient answers. And when everybody is out, the building should or can collapse. We need uh, to accept that. Um, a great extent, I'm not a fire engineer, but um, basically the oval design makes it thicker, and then we hope uh, that that is enough for, for, the, for the event. Does that answer something? Uh, not entirely. <laughs> no. It depends on um, the extent, but I don't think okay. so. I'm going to jump in here because um, uh, I, I have had experience of where a building has had a fire um, a and used um, sprinklers to put it out. Um, that I think uh, it showed two things really. One, one is uh, the fire went out, and the uh, timber, which is great, it didn't it didn't ignite and continue. Um, the 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 damage when assessed to the CLT walls, which is the walls that are exposed, um, show you it, it was quite a good insulator. So it sort of charred at the particular rate that, that we, we calculate for. Um, and so in the assessment of that, we didn't actually have to replace it. We, we took off the char layer, but it was, it, wasn't, it was on the roof level. It wasn't highly loaded. Um, so it, it didn't have to be replaced. It had to be protected more. It was from another fire. Um, the sprinklers... Um, did wet the floor, um, and there was a drying out sequence that was needed, but it didn't go everywhere. You know, it went where the fire was, so uh, it, and it didn't get into the timber very much because it was very short term. Um, so it, it takes a lot. If you a lot, lot of our buildings now have end grain cedar within them, um, so it, so it's the end grain that sucks the water up, um, and when it's sitting on, on the perpendicular grain. It takes a long time to soak into timber. And so, you, so in, a, in a fire scenario like that, you can act quickly, you can dry it out, you can get rid of the water, uh, and you can dry it out. And that does, it does require, your CLT buildings are wall intensive, so it does require a bit of stripping and um, um, uh, ventilating to, to dry it out. But I, I don't see it. it. That kind of question is almost like how long is a piece of string? It depends on how, how severe a fire it can be. Uh, and I quite agree with your point about getting people out. Um, in the UK, we, we, we can have a strategy of stay and put. And I think that should change to actually people should leave the building if it's on fire. Um, and we've had recent issues with that sort of uh, thing. And um, but perhaps that's something that should be changed within the UK itself as well. I have just a, okay, this works. Uh, no, the Swedish Wood Association uh, have actually checked because if you're uh, at least our end client, which is the developer you're interested in, will it be more expensive or can't I get insurance if I choose wood as a superstructure? And there, there was no uh, significant, uh, uh, let's say, result that showed that the insurance company didn't want to insure it. Uh, and uh, then it didn't even show that the, the, the premium was uh, higher. So uh, if you can uh, show via sprinkler or if you clad it or whatever that you can achieve the, the fire regulation, it shouldn't be a problem. But then what's actually 
happening later is what Alan mentioned. It needs to be dried out before you can use it again. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go for one question. We've discussed about lots of topics that are the common topics. When, you know, when we go to timber, this is one thing, fire. We discussed about uh, life cycle. We discussed about embodied carbon. Now, cost. Um, where are we now and where do you see, and this is maybe a um, predominantly a question for you, Jessica, uh, but also for you, Marie. Um, cost of timber. There is um, a belief, an extent, a belief that uh, it's slightly more expensive than conventional construction. There are lots of other benefits, but where are we at the moment in terms of cost? There is actually a premium. Is a high rise due to the uh, economy of scale actually reducing this kind of premium compared to uh, shorter buildings? And where do you see the future? And how can we potentially bridge the gap between uh, timber buildings and conventional construction? There's lots of questions. Yeah, but uh, OK, I can uh, start with uh, promoting the, the paper beton, uh, where they actually checked if it's more expensive to build with wood. Uh, and the conclusion, uh, this was published during Q4 last year, and it was actually showed by the numbers of the whole construction. So it's the planning phase, the execution, uh, but also uh, the developing uh, cost that you uh, always forget, that it's actually cheaper to build with wood. Uh, and they took the, st the statistic from the uh, Swedish statistics, uh, and, and uh, a lot of this has to do with the off-site construction because that's also uh, making it more uh, cost uh, cost efficient. So it's actually not more expensive. I think it's more expensive if you want to convert the project that it's already uh, on the planning phase of being something else. Uh, but looking at the, let's say square meters. Uh, you don't get that uh, far in that analysis. You have to look at, at the groundwork, you have to look at the, the construction time, uh, and also what value you create when choosing wood, because it is a little bit more premium uh, also. There's uh, <laughs> people have this uh, uh, thinking that it's premium, at least in the Scandinavian countries, then it's very different in other countries. Uh, so, uh, of course, you have to stay in your budget, but it's also what value you're creating. And uh, let's say it's an office uh, complex. Is it easier to rent out? Uh, and what? Yeah. I'll, I'll step in here as well. Um, it, I think it's a matter of education with, with cost planners. Uh, in, when we started out using CLT uh, back in 2006, um, a lot of uh, the cost planners we were working with were substituting <coughs> structure for structure and not taking the holistic aspects into account, which you mentioned. Um, so I think uh, and we went through a lot of efforts to say, actually, you know what, you've got less foundations, you've got um, quicker correction times. Um, and, and that message, I think, ben eventually got through to a lot of uh, contractors and developers. And I think it's, it's worthwhile just always repeating it. And as you said, adding the value in, can you put in extra stories into a building? Can you, uh, can you get increase the rates of sell because the, the clients or the end users really want to use the space. Uh, I think it cost versus value is a, ba is a balancing act that needs to be um, indicated at the early stages as well. Cost is always a question. It's, it's a, always a matter of what someone is willing to pay, but <laughs> we can say that it's also a matter of when you decide that you want timber. It's no problem if you talk to one of these volume element producers in Sweden, they say they can make it 15% cheaper or something like that. If you talk four to five stories, talking about high rise, 20 stories, that's still on the pilot scale. That will be expensive and will always be expensive with tall buildings. So that's not really the question of cost in that case. Perfect. Some question from the audience. Just so that we know, how many in the audience are involved in architecture? Can can you can I see your hands? Oh, lots of architects, engineers. Uh, we have uh, authorities, municipalities. Good. Uh, university researchers. Okay, so it's mainly architectures and, uh, and engineering. Good. Uh, there was a question down there. Yes. Can you can you just speak up because we are Sorry, recording it and. Uh, <laughs> 
have to you have to have a hack on your back doesn't it? Uh, a question for you, Florian. Uh, some amazing engineering. I'm a structural engineer myself, but absolutely amazing. I've got one question. The Quelefthio uh, Tower, um, how were you able to transfer all of the shear forces at the podium level, at level six, when you've got prefabricated elements and huge voids uh, in the core? How through timber? Uh, sorry if this is too technical, but uh, oh. no, how, how how was it possible? Because I've uh, all the times that I've looked at timber, I just mm. can't get shear forces out of the timber at mm. a concentrated location. No, uh, what we did, uh, we we took the latest research on on CLT uh, panel shear uh, and how the forces are being uh, taken into the uh, by in the different directions by the lamellas and um, how shear is is being transmitted. We programmed that uh, into we have a we have a custom built uh, design tool that uh, is adapted to all the materials that we use, and we adapted that to to use CLT plates. That was one of the super interesting parts here, and then we calculated it. Uh, the what it turned out quite unproblematic. Uh, uh, the reason is, if you look at that building, it is uh, quite long. Oh, the high-rise part is, is quite rectangular, and the small side doesn't attack, uh, attract a lot of uh, wind loads. And so the forces that had to be transferred, they, they were not that high compared to the other uh, direction where you had that, and this is why the core is exactly that way. So the critical was the one that you mentioned, uh, but um, it was sufficient, it was surprisingly low, Remember, Sheleftio has not the highest wind loads. It does have no earthquake. That is uh, something uh, we designed for in Sweden, but it's no in Norway, but in Sweden they don't have that. Um, uh, so there are a few ways to simplify uh, the standard uh, discussion, but it worked surprisingly well. Uh, there w I don't remember the forces, but I think it was a f yeah, five magnesium or so. I don't know. I don't remember. Is that okay? Perfect. Um, one thing that slightly every one of you touched, um, education and uh, legislation and uh, politics. So um, let's talk about incentives. Do you think um, uh, the future stands in uh, um, um, politicians and uh, municipalities offering incentives? And uh, what kind of uh, a route do you think we should go or there is any idea for a, a roadmap? to potentially um, have uh, selected plots that can only be built in uh, timber, like it happens, for example, in, uh, in Singapore nowadays? And this is an open question mm. to any of you. I would uh, say all, uh, for, for, uh, for my company, all incentives are, are uh, good. Uh, so, uh, but uh, still, it's, uh, we have also chosen to be a material supplier, but also to share our uh, uh, knowledge regarding wood uh, openly uh, with the universities. We're doing uh, guest lectures, and we have this uh, open source of, uh, uh, of BIM objects. and. Uh, calculation tools and so on and so forth, uh, because we want people to learn about this. Uh, it's easy also to get this uh, uh, yeah, sh uh, uh, short, uh, short term and do everything yourself, but yeah. uh, uh, the problem I would say or uh, uh, at the moment is that uh, yeah, it's, it, everyone has lack of time, so actually bringing in this knowledge, uh, you need uh, an interest or a client that are willing to pay some extra uh, hours uh, for uh, for the persons to to uh, think uh, new, but I wouldn't say it, it's lack of let's say architects coming up with the ideas or uh, engineers uh, executing them or main contractor willing to to build. Um, um, and if everything is like <laughs> working in the pace of what you're uh, showing. Uh, we need more feasibility studies as a material suppliers to, to supply the, uh, the coming projects. Uh. Uh, to talk a little bit politics again, even if I'm not, but 
But since I'm from Växjö, which was one of the first cities in Sweden with a wooden strategy and really had a plot of land that also had to be timber, that was a really good beginning 15 years ago when no one was building timber. Today, it's ongoing without that, but it's a really good way to start people to learn how to do this. So for Sweden, it was a good way to start. And that's one reason why we have a lot of timber. In the next step, that will not be necessary to do it like that. If, if you talk Växjö, they are moving away from a timber strategy to a sustainability strategy instead, mm -hmm. which will mean there will be a lot of timber buildings, but not for the material in itself, but for properties. Sure, I, I agree very much to these uh, points. And the, the I think there's a process going on where timber is getting is growing up, it's coming out of the teens, and it is uh, becoming a real uh, material. And this is where I actually want, would like to have it. No romantics around it, it's just working. And um, if you talk about politics, um, I, I think it's a bigger scale. I, I do believe that if you look at all our life, we need to make se severe changes and they need to be initiated and supported by politics. I find it hard that um, companies like us, which are trained to make money to survive, um, push for this without seeing that that gives a gain. And I think uh, I see this in Norway. Uh, there was a lot of pushing of electrical cars. In my neighborhood, everybody's driving electrical cars. Um, there is a lot of uh, pushing to get cars out of the city. No parking spaces available. Works fantastically. Everybody hates it. But then afterwards, when the cars are gone, everybody loves it and uh, gives a lot of support. So, so we have a lot of anxiety towards these changes. I believe they will improve our world. And there's one more point that I would like to have. It's not my ideas. It's uh, something I, I read and, and uh, listened to. Uh, the limits of growth and, and does growth need to change? We are growth driven. But there are people that argue that if growth can be transferred into a different direction, into a more green development, that would make a lot of sense. That would also mean that all these oil engineers that we have in Norway may not be able to, to support that. They will resist it. But then I think we need to be so bold and as, as societies and say, OK, I think you go on a holiday. We, we finance that. But now we need to make a change. And this political consensus that I believe can be done in the Scandinavian uh, uh, countries. And I think it's actually on its way. Um, I find that very, very important to have that political backing. I'll jump in as well. Uh, th there are quite a few progressive companies out there who are actually leading the way on this as well. Th they're, they're looking at their developments, the large developments, and assessing, actually, we think we can do better, uh, and looking at taxing themselves uh, well, for each development we do, um, what's our limit in carbon emissions that we want to achieve in this development? Yep. And, and I think they're the guys we should look up to and hold on a pedestal and say, this is, these are the guys who need to be leading the way forward. And, and they're big enough to actually influence the decision makers in, um, in government, in, in the politicians. Uh, and um, th their voice is quite loud. And because their, vo their voice is quite green, it's, it's someone we should be championing as well. Perfect. Good. I think we reached about time, but let's give a final a round of applause to the presenters. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let's give it back to you. Yes. Thank you for uh, having us. I uh, hope you enjoyed, and uh, it, it was an important, uh, uh, important uh, context. I think uh, we're going to say a little bit about. Uh, this TBUH. Uh, <laughs> if you want to contribute, here is uh, the uh, account that you can. It's my personal. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's uh, our sponsor, and they they appreciate uh, any offer. And also, I want to have to have a little bit uh, of a pre-taster for or the next uh, annual conference, which is going to be in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur next year or this year in uh, uh, October. And I hope you sign up for this one.
Thank you very much. Enjoy the drinks afterwards. <laughs>